Hockey Night in Canada presents me, Peter Puck, your irrepressible imp of the ice, and exciting NHL hockey. Peter Puck here again. This time I'm going to tell you about playing the game. NHL hockey, that is, the world's fastest team sport. What makes it the fastest team sport? Well, for one thing, players speed along at up to 25 or 30 miles an hour, and they, whoops, that me about it speeds over 100 miles per hour. We really move once a game starts. Ah. But you say you have seen the game stop. Well, of course you have. But the only time it will stop is because of a penalty or if someone is called offside or if someone does what we called icing the puck. First, let's take a look at the rink. The game starts right here at the center face-off circle, like this. The referee drops little old me onto the ice between the two opposing centers. Uh, hi guys. Now, easy does it, fellas. This is only a demonstration, you know. Oops! Wow! And the game is on! Oops! Hey, ow! Ouch! Oh, why didn't I listen to my mother and become a bicycle tire? Oops! Ouch! Or an eraser! Hold it! Whoa! Enough of the face-off. Now for the offsides that stop the game. We have two types of offside infractions. First, there's what we call offside at the blue line. The puck, uh, that's me, must always precede the attacking players across the opponent's blue line. I can be stick handled across, passed across, or shot across. Oops. Just as long as it's me first. However, if both skates of an attacking player cross the blue line before I do, that's a no-no. The linesman will stop play, and a face-off will take place in neutral ice at the nearest red dot. The purpose of this rule is to prevent a player from being permanently stationed in front of the opponent's goal. And now for the other offside infraction, known as the two-line pass. This offside is called when a player inside his own defensive zone passes me to a teammate standing across the center red line. Uh-uh, I cross two lines. Now when this happens, play is stopped and a face-off takes place back where the pass originated. And that takes care of the offside rules. Ah, but now we come to icing the puck. Brrr. That sneaky little trick is sometimes perpetrated on yours truly when a defensive player finds the going hot in his zone and decides to cool things off by shooting me all the way. Yikes! Back down the rink and across the opponent's goal line. Whoa! Icing is called as soon as I touch one of the opposing players other than their goalie. Oops. Sorry, Pete. Forget it, Slim. <laughs> In this case, a face-off then takes place all the way back in the defensive player's deep face-off circle. And it serves them right. You gotta play fair, you know. And speaking of play, it's time to play ball. Oh, <laughs> wash my mouth out with slush. It's time to play NHL hockey. Woo! Keep your eye on me. I'm pretty fast. At this time, I'm going to talk about timing, equipment, officials, and players. Hey, cool it, fellas. I got something to say. Howdy, fans. Peter Puck here to lay some facts on you about hockey, the world's fastest team sport. Now, the playing time of a hockey game is 60 minutes, composed of three 20-minute periods, separated by two 15-minute intermissions. Now, to begin with, before the game even starts, I'm given a deep freeze. Ooh, that's to take a little of the bounce out of my hard rubber body. By doing the game, would you believe? I travel around this rink at speeds over 100 miles an hour. And that's pretty fast for a little guy measuring one inch thick by three inches wide. <laughs> now let's look at our field of play. It's called a rink, and not a rinky-dink rink either. 200 feet long and 85 feet wide almost large enough to contain four basketball courts. The wooden sides of the rink are referred to as, what else? The boards. And above the boards, there's shatterproof glass. See what I mean? Beneath that ice are the markings we call the center red line, and the two blue lines dividing the rink into a middle neutral zone and offensive and defensive zones. 
At each end are the goal lines with the goals themselves. They are four feet high and six feet wide. That rectangle before the goal is called the crease, and only the goalie is allowed there, unless I happen to slip in, and then it's fair territory for anybody. Whoop! Hey, wow! Hey, watch it! Hey, wow! These circles and dots are used for face-offs. That's starting play. These are the players' benches and separate penalty boxes. Now about the officials. There is a referee, two linesmen, and two goal judges, plus some clock watchers and a scorekeeper. The referee, in the striped shirt and orange armbands, is the boss. He's in charge. He starts the game, calls penalties, lays down the law, and his decision in all disputes is final. The referee is assisted in his work by two linesmen, same kind of uniform, but no armbands. The linesmen determine offsides, icing, some penalties, face-offs other than center ice. And they control conduct on the ice. No fighting is permitted, and offenders are removed from play. The penalty timekeeper keeps track of the player's time in the sin bin. Uh, the penalty box, that is. Now, at each end of the rink, we have another official, the goal judge. One sits behind each goal in a glass booth. When I, Peter Puck, cross the red goal line completely, the judge turns on a red light. The red light remains on for 12 seconds and is sometimes accompanied by a buzzer or siren, depending on the arena. The scorekeeper keeps score and the statistics, while the timekeeper keeps time. What else? Now for the players. A team has 17 skaters and two goalkeepers. A team puts six men on the ice. A center, right wing, left wing, right defense, left defense, and goaltender. And the same applies to the opposing team. Now the game is basically simple. The two teams attempt to zap me. Oh, there you have it. The fastest team sport in the whole world. It may be rough and tough on a puck, but love that hockey game. Nice save, fella. Hi, hockey fans, youngsters and grown-ups, too. I'm here to talk about NHL hockey. First, let's review a few rules. Hey, there ought to be a rule about hitting a puck when he's not looking. First, I've been telling you that NHL hockey is the world's fastest team sport. Whoops! Well, believe it or not, there are some rules designed to make it even faster. For example, if a player is tagged for a rule infraction and does not proceed directly to the penalty box, his team will be charged with a two-minute bench minor penalty. That means another man also goes to the penalty box, leaving his team with two players short. No more penalty lollygagging without really paying for it. But there are a few special occasions when the clock is stopped. Hey! <laughs> Yikes! That face could stop a clock. Once a goalie could get time out for equipment repair. He could go to the player's bench and remedy his problem. But not now. A goalie in need of repairs must go directly to the bench and a substitute goaltender must take over. And there's no warm-up period allowed. An infraction calls for a minor penalty. It's ready or not. The goalie really goes in cold. But now, that first goalie cannot re-enter the game except during an official timeout. Even if the starting goalie is injured, the sub must move in immediately without benefit of a warm-up. Remember, there are heavy penalties for spearing and butt endings. It'll cost a player a five-minute major penalty and fine. Oh, hey, watch it, you guys. Lay off the rough stuff. There are strict rules against fighting. Any player wearing any foreign material such as tape fists or golf gloves that cut and causes injury, he shall receive a match penalty and his team will have to play one man short for 10 minutes even if the other team scores. But getting back to speeding up the game, the linesmen are instructed on face-off even if one center after prior warning continues to delay the game by conferring with teammates, the puck should be dropped to start play. Fast enough for you? Remember, I get slammed about at speeds over 100 miles per hour. That could be awfully rough on a little guy like me. That's why we pucks are kind of special. 
Let me show you how we're manufactured. We're made from a special mixture of vulcanizing rubber. This rubber is extruded or pushed out of its mold like a huge three inch rubber salami. Individual pucks are cut off at one inch slices. These slices, uh, my relatives, are put in a vulcanizing tray. Team insignias are spotted in place. Then the tray cover is secured and 2,000 pounds of pressure is applied while we bake for 20 minutes. Now we're a bunch of hard rubber cookies ready for finishing. Hard edges are beveled off and then moved on to tender loving care in final polishing so that we weigh between five and a half to six ounces. The last touch is the stamping of the NHL insignia and a new season has its supply of hockey pucks. And by the way, did you know that about 30 of us are refrigerated before every game? It's a cold business, folks. But enough about me. Did you ever wonder how hockey skates are built? Well, you know they have to be very strong. First, the blades are stamped out of steel plate, but even then, this metal needs to be toughened up in a furnace where the blades are heated to 1,550 degrees. Then they are cooled in an oil bath. A second furnace gives the blades their final strength. Other parts are stamped from thinner, pre-hardened steel. These are formed into the tube, the posts, and the heel and sole plates. The blade is fitted into the tube and spot welded. Parts are set into position, then spot welded in place to form the skate. Now it receives a copper dip. This is followed by a solder dip. It is now ready for the final hand soldering of all the joints. It then goes through a series of polishing and grinding operations. A linear polyethylene protective cap is set on the blade heel. After a thorough testing, the skate is ready to be riveted to the shoe. Then an inside sanitizing, a toe stain, and a lacquer spray puts the final touch to this quality product that soon will be chasing me about the ice, worn by a fellow hitting at me with a stick. At one time, a hockey stick was a crooked-shaped tree branch. But today, it's a highly sophisticated, scientifically designed piece of sports equipment. It still comes from a tree. Ash is regarded as the ideal wood. After over a year of curing, it is ready for manufacturing. The shaft is rough cut to shape and graded for flexibility. The blade section is rough cut and set into a groove on the shaft. After gluing, the unit is ready for final sawing and sanding to desired shape. The stick receives fiberglass coating for additional strength, and it's ready to whack you-know-who about the rink. Each game will see me being slammed about the rink, and dozens of times toward the goal nets. Of course, that's what hockey's all about. The goalie's job is to keep me from going in for a score. There are a number of terms for how a goalie stops me. This is a stick save. A glove save. A skate save. A blocking pad save with the plastic waffle. That's the shield on the stick glove. A leg pad save. And smothering. That's really laying it on me. Hey, nice save, fella, but uh, I wish you'd lose a little weight. Wow. Actually, I'm built to take a lot of hard, fast action. See what I mean? Oops. <laughs> See you around the rink. Hold it, hold it. All right, all right, where's the referee? Where's the... Oh, hi. Remember me? Peter Puck. Well, this break in the action will give me a chance to talk to you about penalties, signs, and fines. As you know, the head man of a hockey game is the referee. Uh-oh, he's calling a penalty. That's the signal for tripping. That means that the tripper must spend two minutes in the penalty box. His team will have to play one man short while he's in the sin bin. However, since tripping is a minor penalty unless an injury results, the penalty time could be shorter. For instance, if the other team has no one in the penalty box, whoops, and scores, the penalized player returns immediately to the ice. Here are some of the most common minor penalties and referee signals. Hooking, that's using the stick to impede an opponent's progress. Elbowing, hitting an opponent with the elbow. Holding, grabbing with hand or stick. Boarding. 
That's a violent body check of an opponent into the boards. Interference. Impeding a player not playing the puck. High sticking. Using the stick above the shoulder line. Slashing. A swinging move with stick against an opponent. Charging. Taking more than two strides before hitting. And then there's cross checking. And, and butt ending. But these are minor penalties. However, if the referee thinks it was an attempt to injure, any minor penalty can be called a major penalty. And that means five minutes in the penalty pokey. And the penalized player cannot return to the game even if his team is scored on. Now we get into some time and money penalties. Using abusive language or gestures to officials is misconduct. Uh-huh. The referee's signaling misconduct. That's a 10-minute player penalty and a fine. However, a teammate may be sent in to take his place and his team does not play shorthanded. It's usually a major penalty and a fine for spearing or attempting to jab an opponent with the end of the stick. And then there's match penalty. If a player deliberately injures an opponent, he's expelled for the balance of the game and that'll be a fine too. Depending on the severity of the injury, a team plays shorthanded for five or 10 minutes. Here's a different tripping penalty. If a player in possession of the puck has no other opponent to get past, except the goalie, after he has crossed the red center line and is tripped, a penalty shot is awarded the foul player unless he's injured. Then a designated teammate may take the shot for him. All players leave the ice except the goalie and the shooter. And then they place me on the center face-off spot and the shooter has a go at a goal. This one-on-one -on -one is considered the most exciting play in hockey. When the shooter thinks he's close enough, he gives me his best shot! Love that hockey game! Hi, hockey fans! Thought I'd just slip by. I'm Peter Puck, your knowledgeable, hard-headed hockey expert with a few tips on terms heard during a hockey game. First, you've all heard the term an assist. No, it's not when one player helps another off the ice after a collision. An assist is when player A passes me to his teammate player B, allowing player B to score a goal. In that case, player A is credited with an assist, and no more than two assists are accredited on a goal. Now, when you hear the term save, that's when a goalie stops me from going into his goal cage. Woo! Take it easy, beastie baby. Ugh, it's Halloween all season for this guy. Anyway, he just saved his team from being scored on and gets credit for a save. Next, we have the slap shot. That's when a player raises his stick over his head and... He's off! Yikes! Sending me at those speeds of over a hundred miles an hour! Whoa! Personally, I prefer what is called the wrist shot. It's much quicker and more accurate than the slap shot. <clears throat> and easier on the old, you know what. And now for checking. Checking is guarding, covering, or limiting an opponent's movements and involves body contact. When this delicate art is practiced on defense, it's called back checking. And when done on offense, it's called forward checking. And when checking is practiced on me, like so, this is called sweep checking. Hmm, how sweet it is. <laughs> Hi, fella. It's a little hockey fun there. When a player uses his stick to poke me away from an opponent, oops, that's called poke checking. Hmm, that smarts. And now, have you ever seen a player just sort of skate off and leave me behind to be picked up by his teammate? Well, that's called a drop pass. And here we go, moving right along. And moving right along, let's look at what we call the power play. This bit of strategy is used when Team A has a manpower shortage resulting from a penalty. And Team B, with the one-man advantage, will often replace one of their defensemen with a fourth forward to gain more scoring power. Hence, the old power play. But then on the other hand, there's what we call a penalty killer. That is, when Team A, the team that's short of a player due to a penalty, 
substitutes the regular forwards with defensive specialists. Hence, the old penalty killer. Get it? Oh, yes. Uh, one more thing. Substitutions are made without stopping the game. All a player has to do is make a gesture toward his bench that he wants out, and a substitute is right in there replacing him. Or the coach can make a number of substitutions, and that's called changing on the fly. No time is lost. Which reminds me, speaking of time, it's time to play hockey. Whoops! Oh, those slap shots. Too much of that and the puck could get slap happy. In the meantime, while you're watching all those big guys, keep an eye on yours truly, Peter Puck, the real star of NHL hockey. I'm what the game is all about. Hi there! How's that for action, hockey fans? You know, this game may seem a little helter-skelter, every man for himself, but not so. The individual play and team play are really sophisticated planned action for the most part. Well-coached teams have organized patterns of play which they practice. Sure, there's ad-lib action depending on where I bounce, but players practice a lot of set plays, too. Hey, Raph, uh, give me a hand up for a demonstration, will you? Sometimes set plays are difficult for fans to recognize. That's because the players are so skillful and move from one pattern to another with such speed that it's hard to realize they are actually executing set plays. But here's one prearranged play that's practiced constantly by teams and is easy to spot. It's a shot off a face-off near the goal. Okay, let's go. The center on offense in this face-off tries to draw me back to his defenseman behind him, who then takes a shot on goal. Now here's the most important play that's easy to spot. It's a team bringing out the puck, uh, that's me, out of its own end of the rink. That's called breaking out. It happens when a team has control of me inside its own blue line. When the defensive team has control, one defenseman takes me behind his net while the wingers move to the boards for a possible pass. Then the center skates behind the net. The defenseman can either give the center the puck or keep it, or bring it out himself. The puck carrier continues to carry me until challenged, then he passes me off, usually to his winger. This is one of many systems used. Now here's another interesting play that depends on how the defense reacts. This is the two-on-one breakaway. That is, two players coming down the ice with me and being challenged by only one player from the other team. He's the last man between the two attackers and the goalie. Now, if the defense man stays in between the attackers, the player with me is free to take a shot on goal. But if the defense man moves over to check the puck carrier, he will pass off to his teammate, who now has a shot on goal. Of course, the idea behind all offensive plays is to end up with one man having a clear shot at the goalie. Uh, no offense, fella. It's just a game, you know. But let's look at a play where the offensive team has broken out of its defensive zone quickly. It's called the three-on-two break with two defensemen in front of the goalie. Now the center passes me to his right wing, who goes into the corner taking one defenseman along with him. The center moves up, while the left wing breaks toward the goal. The other defenseman has two men to cover, so the right wing passes to whichever player is free, and that player takes a shot on goal. Another version of the three-on-two starts out as before. This time, the center carries me to his left and slows down. The left wing then cuts in toward the net as one defenseman covers the center. The center passes me through the defenseman's legs to his left wing who gets off a shot. Now, let's look at this again in slow motion. Okay, now here's a third possibility starting out with me carried by the center. But he drops me, uh, that's a drop pass, moves to the right, pulling a defenseman with him while the left wing does the same. Then the right wing cuts to the middle, finds me waiting, and takes his shot. The center and left wing are in position for any rebound. Uh, speaking of rebounds, reminds me of the ALH. No, 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 that's not a new league. It's three famous Detroit players who had one of the trickiest versions of the three-on-two. 
Sid Abel, Ted Lindsay, and Gordy Howe. Sid, the center, carried me over the blue line, passed me over to Gordy, who wound up for a shot at the net, but instead slammed me into a certain spot in the corner. From long practice sessions on this play, Ted knew exactly where to pick me up on the rebound. And he would take a quick shot at a goalie who was often out of position. The scoring would go, goal to Lindsay, assist to Abel and Howe. That's teamwork. And that kind of teamwork is why Abel, Lindsay, and Howe are considered by many to be the greatest forward lines in NHL history. They call them the production line. Oops. You know, in hockey, a goal and an assist each count one point in individual player scoring. There can be up to two assists on each goal. Yep, hockey's a team sport of set patterns mixed with skillful improvisation, much like a basketball fast break. You know, Shakespeare might have been speaking of hockey when he said, the play is the thing. Speaking of plays, that's my cue. Oh, didn't you know? Oh, yes, I do drama and comedy. <laughs> kind of slapstick <laughs> on someone who is slap shot. Get it? <laughs> yeah. Uh oh. See you later, folks. I'm on. Yikes! Okay, let's go. Oops. Hey. Ooh. Watch it. Yikes! He shoots, he scores! Well, you can't win them all. Nice try, goalie. Better luck next time. Thanks, Pete. Hi, kids. You know, all season long, you see lots of great hockey in the NHL, and each team is trying for enough wins to be champs of their division, and then to get into the playoffs, where they go for the Big Apple, the granddaddy of all hockey awards, the oldest trophy competed for by professional athletes in North America. Sure, you guessed it, the Stanley Cup. This trophy has a great history, and we'll give it the special attention it deserves when we tell the Stanley Cup story. But now I'd like to talk about 12 other important awards in the NHL. Way back in 1924, His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, donated this trophy to the National Hockey League. At one time, it was awarded to the old American division winner, then to the NHL champion. But now, it goes to the division winner of the Prince of Wales Conference. In 1968, the NHL club members presented a trophy in recognition of the services of Hockey Hall of Fame member Clarence S. Campbell. And in the conference bearing his name, the division winner gets the Clarence S. Campbell Bowl. This trophy is a hallmark piece. It's made of sterling silver and was crafted by a British silversmith back in 1878. Wow, that's an old. For the player adjudged to be the most valuable to his team, the NHL presents the Hart Memorial Trophy. The original, presented to the NHL in 1923 by Dr. David Hart, was retired to the Hockey Hall of Fame in 1960. This annual award winner is selected by the Writers Association in the NHL cities. They also select best all-around defensive player in that position. Oh, oops, okay, okay, whoo. The winner of best all-around defensive play is given one of the newest NHL awards, the James Norris Memorial Trophy. It was presented in 1953 by the four children of Hockey Hall of Fame member James Norris. These same writers also select the player adjudged to have exhibited the best type of sportsmanship and gentlemanly conduct combined with a high standard of playing ability. He is awarded the Lady Bing Memorial Trophy named in honor of the wife of Canada's Governor General in 1925. She presented this award at that time. The Writers Association also vote for the winner of the Rookie of the Year Award. It was named in honor of Hockey Hall of Fame member Frank Calder, who presented the trophy from 1936 to 1943. This trophy goes to the player selected as the most proficient in his first year of competition in the NHL. When it's all said and done, though, the game of hockey is attempting to score, zapping me into the opponent's goal. The player who rings the bell the most in the league during the regular season is given the Art Ross Trophy. It was first presented in 1947 by another Hall of Fame member, Art Ross, one of the great pioneers of the game. 
and on the receiving end, the goalie or goalies having played in a minimum of 25 games for a team with the fewest goals scored against it, received the Vezina Trophy in honor of the great goalie George Vezina, known as the Chicoutimi Cucumber, who played from 1910 to 1925. The Professional Hockey Writers Association is the trustee for the award honoring the late Bill Masterton of Minnesota. It goes to the NHL player who best exemplifies the qualities of perseverance, sportsmanship, and dedication to hockey. The New York Rangers received a special trophy in 1966 honoring their great Hockey Hall of Fame member, the late Lester Patrick. Since 1966, miniature copies are awarded annually for outstanding service to hockey in the United States. To honor Toronto's Con Smythe, Hall of Fame member and honorary governor of the NHL, the Maple Leaf Gardens Limited established this annual trophy to go to the most valuable player to his team in the Stanley Cup playoffs. The newest trophy is presented by the Radio and Television Broadcasters Association. It is the Coach of the Year Award. By the way, you can see all of these trophies on display at the Hockey Hall of Fame building in Toronto. Well, that's it, kids. These are the valuable honorary awards that give special recognition to outstanding members of the NHL family, and we're proud of all of them. You know, I don't like to be pushy, but I'd like to see him present the Peter Puck Cup. After all, I'm such an ice guy. <laughs> ice, that is? <laughs> hey! Just a joke, fellas! Anyway, keep watching your favorite players. They could be this year's winners. And keep practicing, kids. You could be future champs. Love that NHL hockey! Hi, kids! I'd like to tell you about some very special events in the world of hockey. I call them my memorable moments. Hey! Ouch! But that's one I'd like to forget. Hold the sticks, fellas. I'm about to scan through my old scrapbook. Let me see. Oh, yes, I remember this one. One of the real thrillers. It was the 1928 Stanley Cup series between the New York Rangers and the Montreal Maroons. Montreal had won the first game. In a scoreless second period of the second game, I was being carried down the ice by the maroon center, Nell Stewart. He zapped me at the New York goalie, Lauren Chabot. Whoops! The shot caught him in the left eye, and he was out of the game. Sorry, fella. You know, in those days, the goalies didn't wear face masks, and they suffered a lot for the lack of them. There were no substitute goalies then, either. The New York Rangers had ten minutes to find one. What to do? The manager coach of the Rangers, Lester Patrick, didn't have an experienced goalie among his players. He tried to enlist an Ottawa goalie sitting up in the stands, but the Montreal coach wouldn't allow it. Patrick told his players that one of them would have to tend the net. His center, Frank Boucher, turned to him and asked, How about you playing goal? Lester Patrick was 45 years old. He had been long since retired as a player, but he had experienced brief goaltending fill-ins in emergencies. This was a biggie. He would have to do it. And he did. He inspired his Rangers who played the greatest game of their lives. Every time a Montreal player dared get me close to the Rangers' white-haired goalie, they would come crashing out of nowhere and get me out of there. Well, most of the time. Patrick had blocked a lot of shots, and his Rangers had put them in a one-to-nothing lead in the third period. As fate would have it, that Nell Stewart fella moved me towards Patrick with six minutes to play and tied up the game. But the Rangers' Boucher won the contest two-to-one in the overtime. The Montreal crowd gave Lester Patrick a roaring ovation for his outstanding performance. And with a regular goalie, his inspired Rangers went on to win the Stanley Cup. But Hall of Famer Lester Patrick had provided hockey with one of its memorable moments. But there are more, lots more. Way back in 1936, in the Stanley Cup first round playoff between the Montreal Maroons and the Detroit Red Wings, there was a marathon game. The regulation contest ended tied nothing to nothing, so they went into overtime. I remember it well. I got belted about for 20 minutes and still no score. And then another overtime, then another, and still a scoreless game, and another, and another. The players on both teams were exhausted, and I was a little beat myself. League president Frank Calder refused a request to postpone the finish the next night. 
The teams decided to flip a coin to select a winner or play without goalies. Either way was fine with me. But when they asked the 15,000 fans, they wanted no... <laughs> Tricky finishes, so overtime six was started. Whoops, here we go again. Finally, 16 and a half minutes into the period, Detroit rookie Mud Brunito poked me into the net for the winning score. Wow, it was 2.25 a.m., five hours and 51 minutes after the start of the contest. Hockey's longest game was over, and not a minute too soon. My hard rubber body was softening up. Oh, here's one of the all-time super stories, and it involved one of hockey's greats, Maurice Rocket Richard, the dark-eyed demon who played for the Montreal Canadiens. In a Stanley Cup playoff against Toronto, Rocket Richard was a one-man skating rampage. To his opponents, his dark eyes seemed to blaze with fire. No scores in the first period, but in the second, Richard rocketed me in for three goals. It was the hat trick with assists from the famous punchline. Oh no, that's not the finish. In the third period, he zapped me into the net for two more. Montreal five, Toronto one. Uh, some folks saw it like this. Richard five, Toronto one. When the three top stars were honored, guess what? Yep, the Rocket got the triple honor from 12,500 horse fans. I'll never forget that night, especially the Rocket's blazing eyes. Of course, they didn't really blaze. Or did they? <laughs> no matter. It's part of hockey's memorable moments, and there are lots more I'll be bringing to you. Uh-oh. Yikes! Oh, ouch! Meanwhile, it's back to the old grind. Some of these heartfelt moments I'd like to forget. See ya, kids! Howdy, hockey fans! It's your old poke check professor, Peter Puck, with a few interesting items about one of the real old mugs of hockey. As a matter of fact, it's the oldest trophy competed for by professional athletes in North America. Hey, watch it! Whoa! No, this isn't the old mug I'm talking about. It's over here! This is it, the old Stanley Cup, the symbol of hockey. It's almost as old as ice hockey in North America, which started a long time ago. The first recorded ice hockey game was played in Kingston, Ontario in 1860, but the first formal rules were drawn in 1879 in Montreal. In those days, the gold had no net, just two posts. And when the puck went between them, it was a score. And the gold judge waved a hanky. It was a fast and furious game right from the start and rapidly gained national attention in Canada. So much so that in 1893, a representative of Canada's Governor General, Frederick Arthur, Lord Stanley of Preston, the man who donated the trophy, presented it to Montreal AAA champs, an amateur team. Ironically, Lord Stanley never saw a Stanley Cup game. The original cup cost $48.67 and was about the size of a football. In fact, at one victory celebration, the old mug was drop kicked onto a frozen canal in Ottawa and left unceremoniously until the following morning. A championship Montreal team was once photographed with the cup, but they left the studio without the trophy. It was found by the photographer's mother, who used it for a flower pot for a while. The old cup, once captured, had a history of being ignored. The Ottawa Senators' King Clancy, a Hall of Famer coach and current VP of the Toronto Maple Leafs, left it in his living room as a catch-all for letters, bills, gum, and cigar butts. <coughs> hey, watch it, fella! <coughs> Show a little respect for a symbolic heritage. In 1924, another Montreal player had to fix a flat tire on the way to a victory celebration, but he left the Stanley Cup on a street corner. Fortunately, it was found later that night. And you watch it too, Bowser. Yep, the old mug weathered a lot of rough going. It's had its face lifted a few times along the way. Additional silver sections were added, and what with all the engraving over the many years, the Stanley Cup's value is said to be over $15,000. This top section is an exact copy of the original trophy in every detail. The original is preserved in the Hockey Hall of Fame vault in Toronto. 
Since 1910, when the National Hockey Association took possession of the Stanley Cup, it has been the symbol of professional hockey supremacy. But even before that, teams went all out for the prize trophy, too. Let me show you. Here's my old diary. It says in 1904, a Dawson City team challenged the Ottawa Silver Seven for the Stanley Cup. They traveled 4,400 miles by dog sled, boat, and train, led by the famous King of the Klondike, Colonel Joe Boyle. It took 23 days to get to Ottawa, where they were defeated by the Great Silver Seven, 9-2 and 23-2. It was a memorable series. In the second game, Ottawa's fantastic one-eyed Frank McGee went on a scoring rampage. He zinged in 14 goals with eight of them consecutive scores in 8 minutes and 20 seconds, an all-time record. In one early Stanley Cup series between Winnipeg and Montreal, a heated argument about a ruling caused the referee to leave in a huff, resulting in the only uncompleted game in the history of the Cup series. And there's stories of outstanding player courage. Take the Toronto Bobby Bond saga in 1964. In a Stanley Cup game with Detroit, he was carried from the ice on a stretcher late in the game. After he was revived, he returned to score the winning goal. Only after the deciding game did he admit to a broken leg and have a cast put on it. His team had won and he was named one of the stars. All the breaks went his way, you might say. <laughs> But that's typical of the players' desire in the Stanley Cup playoff series. Since 1917, the National Hockey League has competed for the Cup and has done so exclusively since 1926. It is awarded annually to the team winning the best of seven championship playoff rounds. The oldest award competed for by professional athletes in North America, the Stanley Cup. So, let's get on with the show. The world's fastest team sport. It's NHL time. Whoop! Keep your eye on me, folks! Keep watching Hockey Night in Canada, kids! See ya!